All right. And need to do that. It's been a little bit. It's weird starting in the middle of the week, too. And normally, I'm used to getting a good, you know, lecture and a half of new stuff before uh, before the first week is over. So I forgot that was water and not coffee. I wish that was coffee. Um, excuse me. All right. So the plan for today is um, we're going to go over the syllabus. It's not that different. Um, from from last quarter's, um, except that our final project is not going to be a research paper presentation. Um, it's going to be more of a traditional take home exam um, that's going to be focused on synthesis, um, which is how do we use? We're going to we're going to shoehorn in a whole bunch of new reaction mechanisms um, in this in this quarter. Now that we know how mechanisms work, we have you know we used SN1, SN2, E1, E2 as a you know models for how we can predict how mechanisms and reactions are going to work. Now that we can do that, we're going to add a whole bunch of different types of reactions in there, which is going to give us a lot of utility in terms of, okay, this is how I can convert a chloride to an alcohol. This is how I can convert an alcohol to a ketone. Um, and so once we have all those tools, we have a lot of different possibilities as far as um, how, how can we start with one one possible compound and convert it into something else that we care about. Um, and that can be for a variety of reasons. It can be to do things like make um, make precursors for polymers. It can be for making medications. Um, it can be making for making you know fungicide. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why we need to do small tweaks like move this double bond between two carbons over one spot and all of a sudden we get a whole different compounds and we'll learn how to do that actually, actually one of the first things we'll learn how to do is kind of manipulate alkenes and alkynes um, and make use of rules like Zaitsev's rule um, which remember was the rule that said that when we did an elimination reaction Zaitsev's rule was the one that said we usually make the more substituted alkene because more substituted alkenes tend to be more stable. So unless we had that sterically hindered base, we tended to make the more substituted alkene, but we could change that, right? We could have, by using a different base, we could say, okay, well, I'm gonna make the non zaitsev product. And so all those little details become important when we wanna put a double bond here versus there. Um, and so I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, and I think everybody should have been able to get to the Canvas shell, whether or not you've, you've checked it out yet. Um, you guys all know that this is my primary way of getting information and, and uh, assignments out to you. Um, so continue to check that. Um, it looks a lot like last quarter's. Um, and we'll, I'll just keep adding as we go along here. Um, the uh, each the weekly schedule for each week is not going to really be available till till Monday Monday morning of that week while I get all the assignments squared away and everything just like usual. Um, if you want the overall schedule, um, you can go to the syllabus tab here, and there's a syllabus PDF as well as the course schedule. Um, in in general terms, if you just want to look and see, okay, these are what this is what we're studying this this week. Um, this is gonna, gonna have our overall schedule. And then I'm also including my weekly schedule that has all the Zoom links for where I am at all times. Um, so you can find me um, or know when office hours are pretty easily. It's just as a, as a PDF here that has all the links embedded. Um, so currently, currently we are Thursday at 8 a.m. So we're sitting right right here, but the, all the links should be hyperlinked on here. Um, so it'll open up the Zoom meeting just when you click on it. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for you guys to get where you need to go um, in order to find me. And my office hours now are gonna be right after lecture. I give myself half an hour to make sure I can, you know, make sure my kids are fed and uh, 
my son is doing his his Zoom stuff for for class. Um, so, but uh, ten thirty to eleven thirty are my office hours Tuesday and Thursday now. Now that I don't have Gen Chem, thank you, Carl. Um, and uh, on Monday and Wednesday, it's in the afternoon, two two thirty to four. Um, and then Friday, I've got committee meetings all day, but I can usually, I'd rather be meeting with you guys. So if you need to meet with me on Friday, just let me know ahead of time and we'll schedule something. Um, and that goes for the rest of the time. Anytime I'm not in class, um, y'all ask you to be, be flexible with me because I've got other stuff going on too, just like you guys do. But if you can't meet at these office hour times, um, just let me know and we'll, we'll work out a time that works for us to, to meet. And I promise I won't forget about it more than once. Um, in, in a week. Um, so um, that does happen when I get off my weekly routine, as you guys know. Um, the rest of the, the syllabus stuff, the, the way the grades are going to work is going to be very similar. It's actually, it's over here on the right on the syllabus tab. So assignments is going to be your, you know, lab assignments and um, any homework we do, any in-class assignments are going to go into the assignment categories, 30%. Um, Quizzes, the weekly quiz will do starting, it'll go live Thursday afternoon. You have to take it by Sunday night um, is going to be 30%. And then exams, I, I bumped up a little bit um, in terms of the weight from last, um, from last quarter, mostly because you guys, you guys are doing well on the, on the tests. Um, with them being open book and everything, I feel like I can make them be a little bit more heavily weighted without you guys having without putting too much pressure on you guys in terms of test anxiety, um, because it's looking at everybody's scores last quarter. Um, I think that that's, that's appropriate, especially considering that we're, you know, the, I don't want to put quite as much weight on the labs because we're not doing the in-person labs. I'm not actually evaluating how well you move glassware around. So I'm putting a little bit more emphasis and grade wise on the exams when you showing me you understand the theory at least. Um, but as usual, I'm open to suggestion. If that seems unfair to you, let me know and we can talk about it. Um, and this is all standard syllabus stuff. I think I changed all my hours and everything on here, but the weekly schedule that I showed you that's in the grid pattern, that's the one that's actually really up to date. I may have missed a time in here somewhere. Um, so trust, trust that other one more than this. Well, well, uh, for this first week, while I make sure I don't leave any typos in there. Um, I guess the, the thing that most people, most of you guys are, real, are most concerned about at this point is what the heck are we doing with labs? Um, believe me, that's what I'm most concerned about too right now. Um, it's going to look a lot like last quarter where we're going to do some combination of, of um, various simulations. I found a one sort of interactive simulation for OCHEM synthesis that is um, that's more like a an interactive quiz where you watch a video, we'll talk about some of the theory and look at the glassware, and then you have to answer questions about it. Um, I'm constantly looking for what else we can do to bring some lab stuff into to our class for this virtually. Um, and so the, a lot of that's still up in the air. I'll find assignments. We'll talk about lab techniques and that kind of thing, but it's going to still be virtual um, for the most part. There might be an option for us to do the a synthesis of aspirin. You guys do some, some kitchen chemistry with it. You guys pick up a, a care package from the school. Um, or if you're not local right now, we can maybe work out a way to mail it to you. Um, because I don't think anything that you need, no, acetic anhydride. Um, well, we'll see what I can do. If there's going to be at least one or two where you guys could could do stuff that don't require a ton of tricky glassware and a fume hood. Um, and we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. Um, it might come down to me going in and just you guys watching me do the lab. And then I'll give you guys made up data. Um, say, okay, this is what you measured for your reactant. This is what you measured for your product. So you can at least see me doing it. Um, we'll see if I can actually get a good enough quality to make that, that viable in the lab too, because I it's not, not going to spend a ton of time, my time and your time doing that. If you guys can't even tell what I'm doing on the screen. Um, 
So there's there's still a lot of, of uh, moving pieces when it comes to the labs, but we'll do what we can. And and the final lab report, and actually that's the, the lab final is going to be, um, even if you guys don't have as much experience in the lab, it'll be, okay, here's your final product you're trying to make. Here's the materials you have to work with. How can you do that? And there it's going to be something like three or four steps and you would write out an actual procedure um, to, to some extent and we'll play around with exactly what the requirements are for that based on, on how labs go and everything. Um, but it will be sort of lab focused just on the problem solving side of lab um, as opposed to physically, this is how you would set up the glassware and do it. Um, which I get is nobody's first first choice here, but we we work with what we have, not with what we want, right? All right. Um, any any syllabus type questions, scheduling questions? How are we feeling so far? Twenty twenty one looks a lot like twenty twenty so far, right? Um. So our lab time is not starting at three thirty anymore. Correct. It's now one one to four on Tuesdays. Okay. Um, so a little less of a gap there. Um, I think that'll that'll help everybody. Um, and we will have our first meeting will be next week, and we'll I think we'll probably start by reviewing some NMR stuff. And I think our first your first lab assignment we might start talking about carbon NMR or mass spec. Some of the other common. Um, um modern lab techniques because a lot of the characterization techniques that that traditional you guys actually get a, a little bit of a benefit in that i'm not teaching you the stuff that traditionally we would teach you um, i'm teaching the stuff that people actually use because nobody actually does um qualitative tests like add three drops of this to see if it changes color and then if it does you have an alcohol nobody actually does that anymore um, because we have carbon NMR and proton NMR and IR and mass spec. So we'll spend more time learning what the real techniques are that are used now. Um, and I think we'll start that next week because we didn't get into mass spec last quarter. So probably we'll start with with uh, doing learning about mass spec, which is um, a really cool way we can actually physically measure how heavy a molecule is and how, how heavy pieces of the molecule are um by by playing around with magnetic fields and basically just just blasting it into pieces and you see what pieces are left and what pieces have a charge um so we'll we'll do that for our first lab the next week um and go from there any any other syllabus type questions scheduling stuff um also you guys just to to recap um as soon as lectures are over and i can get everything rendered and downloaded and uploaded in all the various directions on youtube then um, the videos will all go um be posted to the canvas shell as well just like usual um and so i didn't go there yet um it'll all be under the, that week and i'll try to do a better job describing what's in each one so it's not just lecture one anymore so you can see exact a little bit more be, make it easier when you go back to study later figure out which lecture was it that you uh that you needed to review um but so the videos all go right here and then i'll try to keep a, a list of what the various assignments are for that week here as well with the with the links as well so um i think that that structure worked last Quarter. I'm open to suggestions. If you wanted to change anything, just let me know. It doesn't have to be right now. Um, think about it. If there's anything about last quarter, if any, you know, it could be stuff like, oh, your your audio was hard to understand, or the video was not high enough quality. I couldn't see what you were doing half the time. Um, and there there are adjustments and things that I can try and do to fix stuff like that. Although I'm I am limited by my hardware. Um, but uh, yeah, any any suggestions that you do have vocab section oh um in the overviews that's not a bad idea i like that um key terms for that week okay um i will uh i'll keep that in mind i'll keep a running list of uh, important vocab terms 
um, and uh, try and have sort of a, a recap at the um, on the weekly overview. Might not be fully up to date till after we're done and I figure out exactly what, what I want to have on that list um, that week, but that'll make it easier to go back and study later. Cool, thank you. And I, I'm not sure if the textbook has, it has those good end of chapter sections. Um, but I don't know if it has the vocab specifically pulled out. A little bit. So there's a little bit of vocab in here um, that you can also come to the chapters as well. Um, and I'll, so my mine, mine will probably mirror this. Um, it'll be focused more on what we've talked about in lecture as opposed to everything that shows up here. Um, but it'll it'll look a lot like these these terms. Um, just if you're if you're trying to look it over before class or anything like that or while you're studying. Cool. All right. Well then let's let's get back to some OCHEM then. Let's see how much we lost over the last three weeks. And exactly where we can pick back up. All right. So problem one on the test. We started with don't don't try and pick which mechanism is most important. Go through all four mechanisms that we covered in substitution and elimination. So SN2, SN1, E2, E1, and draw all the possible products. Right? And some of them are going to be duplicates. But first step, just go through all four of those, those mechanisms and draw the, the products. And then we'll worry about saying which one's most likely. All right, so I'm going to just be using Moleview and try this first. Um, and we'll start going through here. So let's start with the, so we can start with the, the um, first order reactions because they're going to share a common intermediate, right? So we might as well do this, the ones that are going to have the same step at the same time. So the first order reactions both of them are going to have the very similar first step, right? Or the same first step, really. What's this first step? Leaving group leaves. Leaving group leaves. So that's going to look like bromine takes its electrons and goes home. So our intermediate for both of those, um, is going to. So we didn't change anything on the left-hand side of the molecule. Leaving group leaves, takes the electrons with it, get a, a carbocation. And then, if we make a carbocation intermediate. What do we have to worry about? The uh, resonance there? Resonance and along with the resonance, rearrangements, right? Because we're making something that's relatively unstable. And so if there's a way for it to rearrange to become more stable, it'll do that. Do we have do we have that in this in this molecule? No, there's no tertiary car or quaternary carbons nearby, right? If there was a tertiary carbon next door, then you could move a hydride over and you'd wind up with the positive charge going to a tertiary carbon. Um, if it was a quaternary carbon that had a methyl group, you could even do a methyl shift. 
So these first order reactions have really simple first step, but they do have those extra wrinkles we have to worry about when you make the carbocation. It's got to, you've got to think about, okay, what else could happen now? But in this case, I was nice. Um, we didn't get, didn't have to worry about any of that on the test. So then what's the next step? for a, let's say we're doing this the substitution, first order substitution. Get a nucleophilic attack. Nucleophilic attack. So we have an, a nucleophile right here. The sulfide has a negative charge that's gonna be attracted to a positive charge, which means Next step just looks like that for substitution. And are we going to get more than one possible product here? What's, what are yeah. our products? What? What do we get? Um, the attached, uh, we get R and S. Um, get the R and the S, exactly. Because we're going to actually. So not R and S in this case, because we have two, two identical substituents attached, but we do have a stereoisomer because we're going to get a combination of, so the sulfur is going to be attached. The sulfur can be on the same side of the ring structure. They could both be above the ring structure. They could both be below the ring structures. Technically not R versus S. Normally that's what we're worried about with these first order ones, but because we've got an um, a molecule where going the top way around the ring structure is identical to going the bottom way around the ring structure. It's not R and S, it's cis and trans. Oh, so that actually, so say you put that R and S on the test, that'd be wrong then. You really I mean, would have to drop very, both. Or... Very slightly wrong. You were paying attention to the right things, um, but you missed one tiny detail. And and that's big, that's that this molecule um, the term that we used was that it has an internal mirror plane. Um, when you do that, let me move this around so, okay. so they don't aren't on top of each other. That remember that internal mirror plane makes it a meso compound was that was the vocab term that we used for it. Um, just means that you're not going to have R and S, but you will have cis and trans. Um, and you know, that's a, a half point out of 10 off sort of correction. That's me being really nitpicky. You guys are paying attention to the right stuff though. Now, if we didn't go through a, get out of the annotations here. So those are our first two products we'd get for SN1. If we were trying to get all of our possible products here and we wanted to get <clears throat> our products for SN or for E1, it's gonna go through the same intermediate, right? But instead of, instead of attacking um, the carbocation, we're gonna wind up with that sulfide pulling a proton off. We have it acting as a base instead of a nucleophile. Which again, really being nitpicky with the terms there, right? The only difference is that if it's acting as a base, it's still acting as a nucleophile, it's just attacking a hydrogen instead of attacking a carbon. But in both cases, it's attracted to a partial positive. And then if it does that, if the sulfide is acting as the base, we wind up making an alkene, right? So the electrons that were part of a carbon hydrogen bond move over to the empty orbital, the empty P orbital here for the carbocation. And there are two beta carbons we could attack here, right? There are two beta carbons that, that could lose a, a proton. Does it give us two different products in this case? Only because of R and S, very subtly, right? We're gonna get 
and it's because we have a we make a different stereo center we wind up making if it attacks the bottom carbon we get sorry if it attacks a, a proton from the bottom beta carbon we get this molecule So the, it's a secondary carbon that's being attacked, Casey, but the, the um, main, remember that E1 and E2 is referring to, is it a first order or second order? And first order means it goes through these multiple steps. It's not all at once. So even though it's a secondary carbon doing this, it's an E1 reaction. And then the other product would just look like It'd be the exact same product, except our the beta carbon that we're pulling a, a hydrogen from is the top one, which looks like the same molecule, but we get these are two different stereoisomers, right? Because now this carbon on the on the left hand side is the stereo center and could have R versus S. So again, very subtly um, different. And, and if you want to see that these aren't quite the same, if you try and put the, if you took the molecule on the left and you tried to make it look like the molecule on the right, if it's the same compound, there should be some way you can flip it around or twist it or rotate it to make, to put everything in the exact same position as the molecule on the right. But if you think about this, like, like flipping a pancake, if you tried to put the double bond in the same spot, if you took the molecule on the left and you flipped it like a pancake, you could put the double bond in the same spot, but then your methyl group is going into the board instead of coming out of the board. And then if you tried to rotate it so that the methyl group was coming back out of the board, you're going to put the double bond back where it was. So you can't turn the molecule on the, on the left and make it look like the molecule on the right without breaking a bond. So it is an R versus S difference. And again, that's a half point out of 10, sort of being very, very specific with this. Um, mainly what I was looking for is, did you do any rearrangements that needed to happen? Did you get the right mechanisms? And in this case, is E1 versus E2, is that gonna even make a difference? For this, what would E, let me go back to that, the um, uh, PowerPoint here, clear all these annotations real quick. So if we were just looking at, if it, were, it was going to be an E2 reaction, we'd be looking at at the sulfide attacking that hydrogen at the same time that the leaving group leaves, right? E2 second order means everything happens at once. So leaving group leaves, it's the same steps. Sulfide acts as a base. These electrons move over. The same three steps, no rearrangement happening, right? So for e E2, we would get the same two products. We still have the same two beta carbons, same things are happening. So we would get the same two elimination products. Right, and we'll see that a lot, especially with the eliminations, unless there's a resonance or, or rearrangement that happens, a lot of times the eliminations, you're gonna get the same two products, whether it's E1 or E2. If it went SN2, that's actually, our, that was our first mechanism that we did really, right? That's our simplest one. Everything happens all at once. We do a substitution. Second order means no rearrangement to worry about. And in fact, it means no, we only are going to make one stereoisomer as well. Right, so our SN1, 
mechanism would look like leaving group leaves at the same time as our negative charge, Let's see if I can draw it, is going to come in from underneath. If the bromine is coming out of, out of the board towards us, when it leaves, the sulfide has to be coming in from behind the molecule. So the only product for SN2, I haven't been practicing drawing my hexagons with the mouse again. Got to get, get used to that again. I thought you got a stylish on. I did, I did, but I didn't get all my stuff set up because I wasn't thinking ahead because I'm out of practice today. Um, so we wind up with the, everything's in the same place except our sulfur is gonna be attached underneath. So we wind up only with the trans product. <clears throat> And it's not something we're as worried about yet, but it's one of the reasons why that we're spending so much time talking about first order versus second order right now is that almost always a first order reaction is something to be avoided when it comes to doing synthesis because a first order reaction is almost always gonna make more possible products, whether it's a rearrangement that's happening, whether you're making R, R cis and trans instead of just trans. Um, those are all things that you want to avoid in synthesis. Because if you think about, if you think about the fact that if, if we did this through the first order substitution and we get 50% of it becomes the trans, 50% of it is the cis. Well, if we only wanted the trans, we just cut our possible yield in, a, in an industrial setting or in a, if you're working for a biotech company, you just cut your possible product by half because you can't sell something that's the wrong stereoisomer. You, so really you just wasted half of your reactants. Instead of getting a 90% yield, the best you could do might be a 45% yield now, just because you went through a first order reaction instead of a second order, which you guys aren't necessarily in the point right now where you care very much about that, but it's one of the reasons why it becomes important and why we spend so much time talking about it now is because it makes a big difference in terms of pharmaceuticals and things like that down the road. Hey, Sean, quick question for you and it kind of pertains to that. So then if you do get half, that's not what you want. Is there a way to separate it out so you can use that after or if there's like a purpose for it to use it instead of just tossing it? Um, so there is. I am it's still less than ideal to have to do that because every purification step is another source of loss. There's another place where you could screw up and lose stuff. Or even if you do everything perfect, you're not going to get 100% of it back, right? Um, and actually, it's actually kind of cool. It's column chromatography is the, is the way that they separate R versus S usually. It turns out if you take a compound that's all R and you basically attach it to the surface of these beads, so remember column chromatography was you've got this big glass tube and you fill it with these beads um, and then you put your compound on the top and you just keep putting liquid through and the gravity pulls it through and stuff that is more attracted to the beads goes slower than the stuff that's less attracted to the beads. Uh, and so the, the simplest way to, to do that is you separate things based on size. Um, things that are big make it through the beads slower, but you can also separate based on polarity if you have the beads covered in a polar molecule, or if you're using a really non-polar solvent, polar molecules are going to stay at the top and not move through with the liquid. Turns out to separate R and S, if you cover the beads with a compound that is R, they sort of nest in with other R compounds. The R compounds in your, in your rough product will stick to the beads better than, than the S compounds. Um, and it's sort of like if, if you could, if you think about having um, a bunch of springs in a box, if the springs are all coiled the same way, they can all sort of stick together, right? The edges of one spring can sort of lodge into the edges of another spring. Um, but if, if the spring is coiled the opposite direction, it can't do that because instead of nesting together, they're going to bounce off of each other. And that, 
that's what winds up happening with these R and these S compounds is they physically stack together better if they have the same stereochemistry. Um, and so you can take advantage of that to separate one stereoisomer from another because we can't use distillation because they always boil at the same points. And we can't, and they have the same molecular weight and the same polarity. So we can't separate based on those. So we have to come up with more clever ways of doing it. And basically to get a pure stereoisomer, you have to start with a pure stereoisomer and then use it in this column chromatography to separate out. Um, so it's a little bit tricky. So that's, that's one thing when we can avoid it, we do. Um, and that's the, the classic synthesis experiment is um, in one of the first times that, uh, that you encounter making an, an antimer in a lab, uh, at least for me, because I had really old school um, professors, was making a compound called Carvone. Um, and you make it in a first order reaction. So you get a mixture of the, of the R and the S. And the R is, I believe it's the R is, smells like spearmint. It's the, the compound that gives spearmint its distinctive smell. And S carvone is the, is the smell of caraway. Um, you wouldn't think that those two are related, but they're actually the exact same compound, but mirror images. And when you make them in, a, in the same pot, um, it, it literally took me about a year before I could smell the difference between spearmint and caraway afterwards because it confused my head so much. Um, and then we had to separate them out and, we, and find a way to do that. Um, and then you could smell the difference because it was like, oh, okay, this was my R because it smells like spearmint. This is my S because it smells like caraway. Um, but I had to think really hard for like six months to a year afterwards to tell the difference, which is really weird when they're not that similar flavors. All right, so that was all. That was those were our four mechanisms here um, for this molecule: E1, E2, SN1, SN2. This molecule was going to look very similar, right? Except that we do have a tertiary carbon next to our leaving group, so we've got to be. We're going to wind up with a lot more possible products, I think, here because our first order reactions are gonna go through some rearrangement. And our, our second order reactions, we have to worry about things like Zaitsev's rule. So give this, give this a go. I'll give you guys a few minutes. I'm gonna refresh my water here and I'll come back and we'll work through this.
All right. So I also did just catch that there, I was not specific enough on the problem, right? Because I gave you a compound that was, that had a stereo center and I didn't specify which stereoisomer you started with, right? Um, and so in realistically on the, on the uh, test, if I don't specify which stereoisomer it is, you have to, you're supposed to assume it's a mixture of both of the possibilities. So the way it was written on the test like this, that compound has an R version and an S version. And if I don't tell you which stereoisomer you have, you're supposed to assume it's both of them. It's a mixture of them. Um, so when I was grading this, I was very generous. And, and as long as you told me you were looking for that, you got credit for it. But ideally what I would have given you would have been something looked like this. And so if it's going to go through SN2, let's just let's do it in the reverse order. We'll do our simplest mechanism where we're only going to get one product first. And then we'll, we'll work the other way. If it's going to go through SN2, our process is going to be, so here's our nucleophile, is going to come from the opposite direction as our leaving group leaves. So our product for SN2 is going to look like that. So it's a different base. It's not hydroxide and it's not sulfide. But the process is the same, right? And so anything that you've got that can act as a base or a nucleophile, it doesn't matter what's attached to the oxygen or the nitrogen or the sulfur. Whatever is attached to it just is still attached to the oxygen after it adds, right? So instead of making an alcohol, we made an ether. But the mechanism's the same. Um, and if you were if you were trying to draw this in my ambiguous compound that I gave you to begin with, if, and you wanted to show you were paying attention to stereochemistry, you either could have drawn both possibilities, or you could have drawn it with a straight line like I did, and just written R plus S. Right, that's the, that's the fast way of showing that. Hey, I know that there are stereoisomers there. I'm not going to draw both of them, but they're both there. This is just say R plus S. All right, let's do our other second order reaction. Our SN, or sorry, E2. And remember with E2, we're looking at the beta carbons. We're looking, our leaving group is still going to leave. That's still part of this. Our base is just going to grab a proton off of a beta carbon and it's being second order means no re new, no rearrangement so we wind up with keep it color coded here we will either get this compound or that compound. So because we're, we have two beta carbons that have protons, we still, we have two possible elimination products, even though it's still, even though it's second order. And then if we were trying to pick which of these would be the major, that's when we would get into, okay, how do we make the most substituted? 
because we don't we have a strong base that's not sterically hindered. So we make the Zaitsev product, the most substituted product. All right. What happens when we go through a first order? What's our intermediate, what's our first step? If it's first order, we got more than one step happening, right? Means slow step happens first, leaving group leaves. And so we wind up with an intermediate that's gonna look like that. Is our, what happens immediately after our leaving group leaves? rearrangement and then we have to worry about rearrangement right so we don't care about this beta carbon because that would that beta carbon if we moved a proton from over here we'd be making a primary carbocation which would be less stable but we do have a hydrogen on the other beta carbon and if those electrons move over, they're gonna drag the hydrogen with them. And so our intermediate, our real intermediate winds up looking like that. Positive charge is on the tertiary carbon on the left now. And then we go through our same, our same steps as before as SN2 and E2. Now we have our base can come in and either directly attach. And we, if we do SN1, we're only going to get one product now, right? Because there's no stereochemistry now. Because what happens when we attach? Why isn't there any stereochemistry? Two of the same substituents? Those methyls are identical, exactly. When you have two of the same thing attached to a carbon, you can't have R and S because these would be the exact same priority, right? Or the other way of thinking about it is you could switch them without changing the compound. If you switch this methyl with that methyl, nothing would happen. It'd be the exact same thing. So this now gives us our SN1 product, one SN1 product, one SN2 product, two E2 products. This one, this was a very carefully chosen molecule other than the fact that I didn't give you the right stereoisomer to begin with, um, because every different mechanism actually gives you a different product this way. Usually there's going to be some overlap and there still will be with the elimination, right? One of the elimination products winds up being the same for both of elimination mechanisms. But you get one unique product at least from each of the mechanisms. It's not made by any of the other mechanisms. So then our last our, if we go through the E1, our positive charge is here. So our beta carbons are where the leaving group started. And then the two methyls over here. And so we could make that product. And that's the one that has some overlap. Right, because we, this elimination product, this eight step product, is the same for both of them, E1 and E2. Despite the rearrangement, the most substituted alkene is the same in both cases. Do we need to worry about cis and trans, E and Z, for the alkenes for any of these? In every case, you have one of your carbons has two identical substituents on it. 
So in this case, you have two identical hydrogens at the end. So there's no E and Z. Here, you've got two identical methyls. So if you switched them, it would be the same molecule. So no E and Z. Same here, same product. And then again, two hydrogens that are identical. So no E and Z here. All right, let's, first off, any any questions on, on what we've been doing so far? Should all be pretty familiar to you, even if you would not have been able to do this on the on the fly um, after three weeks off? Sean, should you have included um, the products, um, like the SN1 product without doing the rearrangement? Um, Typically, no, we don't do that. So if you have a rearrangement happening, especially if it's a hydride shift, it happens fast enough that we, we basically assume all of our carbocation will go through the rearrangement. It becomes a little bit more of a fine line when we were dealing with a methyl shift because that happens slower because the methyls are just physically bigger. So it takes longer for them to move over. Then we'd start splitting hairs maybe. But in general, if a rearrangement is going to happen, assume all of it rearranges. I all right. have a quick question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for the last part, um, when we're doing the um, we're like the proton transfer or the re, um, sorry, um, with the, I'm sorry. <laughs> Why, um, why are we taking the hydrogen from that, um, from that carbon instead of going from like the very far right, or maybe your far left, yeah, your far right carbon? Why would we, why would we move the charge over? Is there no situation that we would take it from the other? You mean for the rearrangement or for the elimination? Yeah, for the rearrangement, sorry. Yeah, we wouldn't take it from the other beta carbon. Because that wouldn't be putting a, we, if we did that, we'd be putting a positive charge. So let's look at what the pro product would look like then. We'd be making a primary carbocation if we did that, right? Because after everything moves over, we'd be left with this. Remember, that would be going uphill in energy. Primary carbocations are way less stable than secondary. Mm -hmm. And secondary is way less stable than tertiary. So we only have, so that won't happen. Okay. Because we're always trying to put the positive charge on a more substituted carbon okay. um, whenever possible. Or a carbon that has more resonance. If they're the same substitution, you can still have that, but that's splitting hairs. Okay. Any, anybody else have anything? I will, I'll let you marinate on that a little bit, formulate any other questions you do have. Let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, let's come back at five after and we will do a little bit more review and then we'll get into undoing elimination reactions with addition reactions.
Professor Rayland, I had a couple questions for you. Yeah, so you can just call me Sean. How's okay. it going, Casey? Good, and yourself? Doing all right. Yeah. So if I'm looking at like E1, E2, SN1, SN2, they can all occur? Yeah. Um, so the, the second half of the test really was how do we determine which one is going to be most favored at any given time? And um, our, the textbook does a decent job, let me go back to sharing screen, um, of, um, we basically have this sort of chart here on the right hand side um, that just allows us to say, okay, if it's a strong base, but a bad nucleophile and our, our um, carbon that has the leaving group is primary, and then we're going to see predominantly E2, right? So we, we basically are going to fit into one of these categories based on our reaction conditions. Um, and we can get a little bit more specific even and, and really split hairs like on this, if it's, if we have elimination versus substitution can both happen, we can actually favor elimination or substitution just by changing the temperature. We can get that, that ratio to slide back and forth. Um, but it's always going to come, figuring out which mechanism is dominant is always going to come down to how good is your leaving group and how strong is your nucleophile or your base um, among some other conditions. And that's, but the others are still happening. They're just happening at a much slower rate. So statistically, there's so much less of them in the product mixture that we really care mostly about the dominant mechanism. Okay. So if you're saying predict any product, then we could say any four of the mechanisms. But if you're saying which one is favored, then you would choose the one that's favored. Exactly. Or I'd say what, okay. what's the major product? Gotcha. Thanks. Hey, Sean, I actually I had a question about, um, I think it was E1. Um, I know it's splitting hairs, but you said that the non rearranged product wouldn't actually occur. Is that just splitting hairs or you're saying it would like it would like a insignificant amount or not at all? Um, an insignificant amount. When, okay. you, when you think about the, when you think about the steps that have to happen in order for the elimination to happen, you need your base to run into the molecule, right? So that's statistically, you need two things to bump into each other and be facing the right way for that to happen. But mm -hmm. for a rearrangement to happen, all the pieces that you need for the rearrangement are already on the molecule. You've got a charge and you've got a hydrogen that can move that's right next to it. And so, so statistically, that happens much faster because you don't need to wait for two things to bump into each other. It's already right there. Okay. Yeah, I see that. Thanks. I was going to ask with the ice bath, I couldn't figure out, is the ice bath supposed to just chill it down so it stays in its isomer or? I think, I guess I did, I, oh, there it is. Um, so does this equation look familiar to you? Delta G gives free energy. So back in Gen Chem, we use that to say, okay, if something has a negative delta G, that means it would, it's spontaneous, right? And spontaneous just means that equilibrium favors making the product as long as delta G is negative. But really, we can turn that into um, that delta G has two pieces, delta H, which is um, the enthalpy or the bond energy. Mm -hmm versus this T delta S term. And delta S is entropy or, or disorder, right? Randomness. And so that because the temperature is attached here, by changing the temperature, we can make this term bigger or smaller. And so the, the qualitative way to remem remember it for all the way back here is 
if it says in an ice bath, if sorry, if, if it says with heat, that means you're gonna favor elimination because you're making more pieces. You go from having two molecules to having three molecules if it goes through an elimination reaction. But if you go through, if it's a substitution, you're going from two molecules to two molecules, right? You wind up with the same number of pieces before and after. And so the entropy favors elimination reactions always because you're making more randomness. And so at high temperatures, you're making that entropy randomness part of delta G bigger. So high temperatures always favor elimination and low temperatures favor substitution. Thank you. No problem. All right, I do indeed have my stylus set up again. I'm glad I brought a two pack because immediately after our review session, um, my daughter decided that that looked like the coolest pen. And so it went walking somewhere, somewhere in the house um, because where else could it be? It's not like we've gone anywhere. Um, but uh, so I do have that set up now. We should be able to give that a, a go if we need to here in a minute. Um, so if we're trying to pick a mechanism here, um, it's going to be there are a couple of key aspects we're looking for. And mainly it was this this figure here, right? The strong is a strong base weak nucleophile, strong base strong nucleophile, weak base weak nucleophile. Weak base, strong nuclear. Those are our four possibilities of, you know, if you draw a Punnett square of bases versus nucleophiles and strong and weak for both of them. Um, and, but what mattered even in a lot of ways mattered um, at least as much as whether it was a good nucleophile or not was what, where was our leaving group? Um, and you'll notice that for most of these conditions, we're going to go through second order reactions. Second order reactions were, are way more common just if for no other reason than um, 
the making a carbocation is relatively unstable. So you're not going to do that that often unless you have something else slowing down our second order reactions. That leaving group leaving on its own to make a carbocation is unstable enough that it's going to be really slow. Um, however, if you do have a tertiary carbocation and you've got a weak base, and these ones, remember that this is gets into that splitting hairs region. This was our simple figure said that if it's secondary or, or primary, we don't see anything happen here. That's not exactly true. If we change conditions, if we put it in the right solvent, um, we can still get first order reactions to happen if it's secondary, probably not if it's primary. We're never gonna have a first order reaction happen if it's primary. Um, but if it's secondary, you might you could potentially have, especially if a rearrangement could then happen after the leaving group leaves, um, you could still wind up with it going that route. Um, so just quickly to, to go through these possibilities, um, what's TBU okay? Anybody remember? Tert butoxide. Tert butoxide, um, potassium, tert butyl, alka oxide. Um, it's basically, it's a strong base, but it's sterically hindered. Um, and so that, that fits into the strong base weak nucleophile. It can't be a good nucleophile because it physically can't get close enough to that carbon. It's got too much other stuff in the way, too much spinach. So that tells us it's not going to go through SN2 or SN1. It's only going to be elimination. And the fact that it's a strong base and a bad nucleus, we have a bad leaving group as well. Um, that's not on our chart on the right, but hydroxide is not a great leaving group. That's another point in favor of it being a second order reaction because it won't leave easily. All right, so that one, A, is going to be an E2 to learn how to write with this thing again. Um, for B, ethanol is not a great nucleophile or a great base. But it's just there as the solvent, really, because we do have a strong base that's also a strong nucleophile in the eth oxide. Um, so strong base, strong nucleophile. We have a secondary carbon with the leaving group, technically, except it's got resonance as well, right, which makes it even more stable. Um, so. This is one where if you said that I was a little bit lenient, um, but I believe our other cheat sheet that we were using um, had a better, was had a more complete description of what was going on. So let me pull that up real quick. Actually, I know where it was. The problem with having found and then saved all of these great figures in my Dropbox folders. I have to remember where the heck I saved them. So the secondary benzylic, this is a benzylic leaving group because it's adjacent to a benzene ring. Oh, we've got a strong nucleophile and a strong base. We're going to have both of these are going to be the second order reactions. And in fact, it doesn't specify a temperature, means we can go with the most common here, which is going to be the elimination. Right? If I specified in an ice bath, we might say substitution was more common. Does the uh, protic solvent come into play there at all? Um, the protic solvent, so a protic solvent is going to stabilize 
the nucleophile more, right, than normal. Um, and in a protic solvent, we stabilize the nucleophile more. So not, I don't believe it does in this case because it's a secondary and benzylic. I have to look at the key that we wrote here. Um, um, I do not remember what I said, what we said for that last quarter. It's early in the morning and early in the quarter. Um, so protic solvents are going to make the no, it's not going to really make a difference. We really saw that when we had when we were looking at the halides, remember, because that that could make a good, what was a weak base could be a strong bit stronger base if it was in the protic solvent, and vice versa. Um, I had written a little, little note for myself that said protic solvent equals SN one or E one. Maybe I took that note wrong. I did the same thing, Cody. Okay. Then, then that's probably where we left it last time. Give me, um, ask that question again on uh, on Tuesday when I've had time to review that myself. Um, typically, the protic solvent is going to be the, the last variable. It's the, it's the least important of the variables when we're deciding this. So it's like when we're really splitting hairs, although this is a splitting hairs question. So um, I'll review that as well. And we'll go back over that. And I'll try to remember what I said um, last, last quarter, make it consistent at least. Um, all right. We'll leave that alone for now though. Here's one we, that we definitively have an answer to. We've got a good leaving group and it says with heat, we've got a weak base, weak nucleophile in water and it's got heat. Um, and it's a tertiary carbon that has the leaving group. So it's definitely first order. Heat tells us it's definitely going to favor elimination because we're going to look at that entropy piece. We're going to go heat favors elimination because we're making more pieces. So more entropy. Um, and conversely, if we have an ice bath, that's going to favor substitution, right? And, and the exact temperatures are going to, it's going to depend exactly on what the leaving group is, what the, the reactants are, um, as far as, well, can we even do it at an ice bath temperature? Or do we need to go to dry ice temperatures or is room temperature considered low temperature for this? That's all going to depend on the specifics. Um, but just for the sake of me signaling you guys, this is where you should be thinking. Ice bath just means you're going to favor substitution. Um, and again, weak base, weak nucleophile, protic solvent. So favors first order for sure. And that's in that that region this that's where i don't i'm not a huge fan of this figure i like the color fact that's color coded and really easy to understand but it oversimplifies because it says nothing will happen well that's not exactly true um if we have it it's going to happen really slowly you might be waiting on this reaction to happen for ne till next week um but you could get this reaction to happen and the ice bath means it's going to favor the substitution. So S and one. And then down here, we've got sulfide as our. Sean, I had a question about that last one. Yeah. Wouldn't it actually turn into a rearrangement and make it tertiary? It would, it would. If we're just trying to decide what the mechanism will be, we could we just stop at SN1, but as far as actually writing the products, we'd see a rearrangement happen. And so we'd get the... Well, I just, I just meant in terms of, you just said it was secondary. So the chart would say nothing would happen. 
So, in, so this this chart is saying before any rearrangement happens, it's, it's asking uh, where the leaving group is. The leaving group is on a secondary carbon, even if then it would then rearrange. Oh, uh, okay. Um, and that is one of the one of the factors that would say, well, yeah, they say nothing happens, but if it's a secondary that can then rearrange, that does drive the equilibrium towards towards leaving group leaves because, um, but it we would still say that the leaving group is on a secondary carbon. Gotcha. And then it's not on the on the simplified list here, but a um, thiol and thiol ion um, is going to wind up being a strong base and relatively strong nucleophile as well. It's, it's not as strong as any of these alk oxides or hydroxide, but sulfide is still going to be relatively strong compared to something that's neutral um, or a halide. And so we wind up with this going through in this middle category here, we've got a tertiary leaving group, so E2. And B is the one that I have a question on. This does match what I'm remembering vaguely about when I when I wrote the key. I remember thinking, oh man, I, I didn't mean to give them um, four elimination reactions out of five here. Um, so that rem seems seems right to me it's just is be2 versus e1 i have to go back and look at the protic solvent stuff to, to double check that for you sean yeah. maybe i missed this but um it says under the chart that it's a weak base and a strong nucleophile oh, yeah, you're, no, you're right you're absolutely right oh, okay yeah i was I gonna say the same thing that. <laughs> um so not that. So I got too preoccupied with making sure I knew where we were going with the addition reactions after this that I forgot to review the stuff from last quarter. And I haven't taught this class as much as Gen Chem, so I can't do it on the fly as well. Um, this is what happens with 8 a.m. classes. So weak base, strong nucleophile puts us into this category, still tertiary. So this would say SN1 as well. Um, hey, Aaron is here. Um, and this is a perfect chance to take a quick, not a quick break, but to, uh, before we get into new material here. Um, and those of you guys who don't know Erina, um, Erina just or is our, I'm going to, I've never tried playing around with the spotlight. So I'm going to spotlight Erina. So I'll just put you on the spot. Okay. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I'm like talking through this. <laughs> well, um, go ahead. Well, yeah, I just, um, I just wanted to hop on and say hi. Um, I'm the tutor this year and I haven't actually met anyone cause we're still doing, you know, online, which is a bummer, but looks like you guys are still getting good info. And I just wanted to say hi. So you know me, um, and have a face to the name and I will have office hours. We're going to solidify that with, uh, Sean here, but, um, if you just go onto the coyote corner, you'll see my name and It'll be about four hours a week, but I'm pretty easy to get a hold of if you can't make it during my hours and you need extra time elsewhere. So it's nice to meet you guys all. Awesome. Thank you, Erina. Yeah. Um, and and that reminds me as well, I'll pull up the, let me clear all these annotations. Um, and so I know you, I can see you're, you're at work, Erina, so I'll let you get back to work, but thanks okay. for, for stopping in and, I'll, uh, and we'll talk um, later about what hours work better for you. Okay, cool. All right. Bye guys. Have fun. Um, let me, I got to clear all my annotations here. Um, and if you have not done any of the virtual tutoring yet, um, it is, if you go to LTCC's website, um, we have this button over on the side now that says virtual campus. Um, and then from there, 
think, yeah, if you go to student support, one of the options is um, the library. The library runs all of our tutoring programs and it has a button for tutoring here. Um, and it, if you haven't used Cranium Cafe before, it's basically, they, they try to make it a lot like just having an office for somebody where when they're online, you can just go and you just click and say live chat or you can video chat as well. And all of the tutors are on here as well. Um, but this is also how you can get a hold of Mel. Um, Melanie Chu is our is our head librarian who has a lot of resources for you if any of you guys need um, have technology needs or need to check out the book, um, the textbook or um, the uh, mo molecular kits, the molecule kits um, for building molecules, um, which I know a few of you guys still have yours from last quarter, which is which is fine. Don't forget that they're the colleges, though. Um, we're going to put some of our chemical budget towards buying more of those for next year anyway, so that we have lots of them for everybody. But there's also all of the tutors, if you, sc if you scroll down, um, are all in here. Um, and, and Erina is our OCHEM tutor. She's the chemistry tutor in general, but most of these other math tutors could help you with some of the chemistry, but not with OCHEM. Um, so you guys are going to are gonna want to talk to Erina and is she not? She's not on here right now. She must not have set her hours or something at this point, or I'm just missing her. Um, but then, yeah, when you go here, if they're online, you can do the knock on door. And then that basically, you know, you can get into a one-on-one a, a -on -one video chat um, to do some some tutoring, or you can just do do live chat as a um, by typing if video is not working. You can't really do this while you're also doing Zoom. Um, so I have not don't have as much experience with it because every time I do this, it's with you guys and I'm already on Zoom and then my webcam is all tied up and then I can't actually get it to work. Um, but in theory, that's where you would go for tutoring um, and uh, and we'll we'll get some good hours. We'll pick hours that don't overlap with my office hours or this class as much as possible um, to make sure that we we do that. Um, and well, as, as you can see, Erin also works at Barton, so she's got limited availability there. So we're kind of have to work with her, her real work schedule as well. She's doing this as a favor to us um, anyway, because it's not like LTCC pays that well um, for our tutors. So um, we want to make it work for her too. All right, for now, we're going to, we're going to skip over, we'll, we'll review NMR and IR um, in uh, lab on Tuesday, so we can get more to um, some new material. Um, remind yourself of the, we'll probably do a little warm up on Tuesday in lecture by doing some of these nomenclature questions, um, unless anybody had one from the test that's still bugging them that they, that they uh, wanna know if they did it right or not. If you, don't know off the top of your head, that's fine. Um, they all look really complicated, right? But it's always the same rules. Find your longest carbon chain. Figure out what your branches are. Name your, name your branches, number your branches, or whatever else is attached, and then worry about stereochemistry. All right. I was going to, we're going to start talking about undoing elimination reactions. Um, so first I thought I'd get us to flip our point of view a little bit and think about working backwards. Um, if we have, if we're trying to make this molecule here and we have two choices of the alkyl halide we can start from. So we're, we're gonna go through an elimination reaction. This is a one-step synthesis. We're just trying to start from, from a bromomethyl cyclohexane and go through an elimination. And we specifically wanna make just this molecule. Which of these should we start from? RJ, you were pointing to the right, I think, but the mirroring on Zoom makes me always, I'm never quite sure. 
Yeah, I, I was pointing it right. I'm not exactly sure if that's correct, but I would guess. Well, right. what's your what's your thinking? Um, I was thinking the one on the right because then you have the beta, uh, the beta carbons once that once that um, bromine leaves, and then you would have that double bond to the yeah to the left or right because it would be hooking on to one of the hydrogens to the left or right. One of the beta, sorry, one of the beta carbon hydrogens to the left or right of that. Um, where that carbon would be. Good. And that that makes a lot of sense, right? We have two identical beta carbons then, right? If we have two identical beta carbons, that's the wrong, that's the wrong thing. Then that means that we're going to get the same product other than stereochemistry as we saw earlier. It doesn't matter which of the beta carbons get loses a proton, right? We're still going to make something really close to the same molecule. We'll make that molecule, or I have to hold it, otherwise it slides and it looks even worse. Or we get that molecule, which if we're not considering the stereochemistry of that methyl group, those are the same, right? Like we saw earlier. Versus if we look at the other possibility, we have two beta carbons that will give us two different products. We won't, one of the beta carbons would give us three methyl cyclohexene, and the other one would give us four methyl cyclohexene. I can't count today either. We could get that molecule or that molecule. Those are not the same, right? So from a synthesis point of view, similar to what we were talking about earlier, it makes a lot more sense to start with the molecule on the right as opposed to worrying about half of your product could wind up being um, the wrong isomer. Right, and so this is I'm also using this as a way to remind ourselves that these open arrows, when you have arrows drawn this way, those are what are called a retrosynthetic arrow, meaning that we're really going to be trying to go backwards. If you're starting from your target molecule, you can use the retrosynthetic arrows to say, okay, here's what was the step before that. We're trying to go backwards from the target molecule to our starting material. Um, when it's just a one-step synthesis, it seems kind of silly to do that. Um, what, when you get into more complicated synthesis problems, it makes a lot of sense to say, okay, this is where I'm going. How do I go one step back from that? And then sort of work your way backwards until you get to something, to a, a starting material. Um, and we will be, like I mentioned, we will be spending a fair bit of our time on, on synthesis in this class once we start adding some more pieces in. So let's do that. Let's add another piece. So if we are trying to, if we're starting from an alkene and we're trying to, um, we're basically going to be undoing an elimination. So these are what are called addition reactions. More specifically, these are electrophilic addition. Um, because electrophilic addition, because um, instead of having a nucle the nucleophile that's going to come in here and attack a partial positive, an electrophilic addition, you have your first step is going to be something with a positive charge or a partial positive comes in and attacks that double bond. So it's the opposite in more ways than one. It's the opposite of, a, of an elimination reaction. So what so our, our steps that we'd be looking at here, let me zoom in on this real quick. Um, 
what this actually winds up looking like is if we say, okay, if we know this reaction happens, put you guys in terms of thinking about this mechanism, what, what is going to be attracted to that, that electron density, the pi bond? Your hydrogen, right? The hydrogen, exactly. We know that the bromine's more electronegative than the hydrogen, so the, the hydrogen has a partial positive. So our first step is just going to be, it's almost similar to our, our first order reactions. Our leaving group leaves, except it's the leaving group is just is leaving, leaving the hydrogen. So that leaves something with a positive charge, which means that the electrons from that pi bond can grab it. So it really is like the exact opposite of an illumination, right? Eliminations, a base came by and grabbed the proton and the electrons stayed to make the pi bond. Here, the pi bond grabs the proton from the base or what the conjugate acid of the base. So we wind up with a, with an intermediate that's just going to look like, what, what was our, what would our intermediate look like then? So. Secondary carbocation on one side of the, what used to be the, Exactly. So if we say the hydrogen is going to wind up attaching to one side, but we broke the pi bond, which means we have an incomplete octet around the, the other carbon. And these two carbons are, are identical in this case, right? It's symmetrical. Then what happens? If you have a carbocation and you have your bromide still sitting around. Nucleophilic attack. Nucleophilic attack. So literally the exact opposite of elimination. Right? Elimination, the first step is the bromide leaves, and then you come in and the base takes the proton away and you make an alkene. Here, it's the exact opposite. So out of those steps, what would be the slower step? What's our rate determining step here? Is it the last one, just because it's bigger? It's bigger, but we do have more force, more, more. It's more downhill in energy, though, too, right? Because we've got an unstable carbocation. So usually, if we're going to, if you can point to one one step and say, well, I'm making something that's less stable than what I started with. Almost always, that's going to be your rate determining step, especially when it's a significantly less stable, like making a carbocation. The step that actually makes the carbocation will be your slow step. Because then now you've got something that's really uphill or that's really high in energy and it's going to find something to become more stable. Will you um, say the rate determining step again, like like a little slowly so I can just quote you on my notebook? Yeah. So a rate determining step is going to be, I forgot I had it set up for me to draw the um, mechanism here. So the is going to be the step that makes the carbocation, which is going to be this this first step where you break the pi bond where the pi bond grabs that proton from the HBr. Because then we wind up with, and it doesn't matter where we put the positive charge in this case, because we have symmetrical carbons. We wind up adding the hydrogen to one of the carbons and, we have, and then we have um, a carbon with only three bonds on the other side.
right? And then once you make something unstable, getting that to react is going to be easy. It'll react with anything around that has a negative charge or a partial negative charge. So that's, again, it's going to be our nucleophilic attack. How about stereochemistry here? It's there, right? It's there. We made something that has four distinct things attached to that carbon. Are we going to favor one isomer over the other? Is it no because there's no alkene? There's no alkene, so definitely not any any E or Z or cis or trans. And we started with something that was planar, right? The alkene we started with was flat. So that means that this first, and, and actually we made a flat carbocation as well, right? Which means this second, this second step could have happened from either direction from above the molecule or below the molecule. So we have, if we are starting with something that's totally planar and we're going through a planar intermediate, we're gonna wind up with an equal probability of R versus S. So does it matter what the nucleophile is in the second step? Probably matters like how bulky it is, maybe. Matters how bulky it is. But any any nucleophile is going to be attracted to a carbocation, right? So in terms of deciding how much product we're going to be we're going to make, it'll matter or which product will be favored maybe, but there are loads of different nucleophiles that we have, right? Any one of which would work for this second step. So this addition reaction, the same basic addition mechanism can happen with any nucleophile. Let's see, if we do, so we, we frequently will have it written as, you know, the, um, as a halide addition. So HCl, HBr, HI, HF, even to some extent, any of the, the hydro, hydrohalic acids, I think they call them, um, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, any of those acids will go through the same reaction because they're, they're all strong acids that are going to start by the same first step. You're just going to have a different nucleophile left over. But even water can go through this reaction, right? Because if you started with water instead of HBr up here, well, if the water donated a proton, if the water acted as an acid to start this process, then you're left with hydroxide over here, which is a good nucleophile. And then we, instead of adding a bromine here, we would just wind up adding an OH group, right? So this is a really a wide range of different reactions. They're all considered different reactions. If you do this with water, it's called a hydration reaction because you're adding water to the molecule. If you do this with an a, with a hydrobromic acid, it's hydrobromination, but really, all it is, is it's an addition reaction where you have a different nucleophile. Um, what if we don't have a symmetric carbocation? If our first step is break up the alkene and add a hydrogen to one side and you're left with a carbocation, Which which product is going to be more likely? I guess if we have if we're just looking down here, there's I wrote it as a multiple choice question down here. If we're looking at these three isomers, we know our rules for carbocation stability right now, right? Tertiary equals better, well more stable anyway. I'll leave off the qualitative um, 
judgment comments. Um, we don't want to charge shame our primary carbocations. Um, so tertiary is more stable. Primary is less stable. So if we have to pick, if we have two different carbons that are in the alkene bond and we have to pick which one gets the positive charge, where are we going to add the hydrogen and where do we put the positive charge? Hydrogen on the primary, positive on the tertiary. Hydrogen on the primary, hydrogen on the less, we, if we make it a little bit more general, hydrogen on the less substituted carbon, positive charge on the more substituted carbon. So we wind up making this product almost exclusively. We make almost none of the opposite where we would put the bromine on the primary carbon. Right, because we have to go through that carbocation intermediate. And if we have a choice between putting a positive charge on a secondary versus a primary, it's always going to go on the secondary. And 99.999% of the time. And probably even more than that, more nines than that, because even if you did put a positive, a make a primary carbocation, you would just then do a rearrangement. So it would still, even if statistically it happened to bump into it in such a way that you put the hydrogen first on the tertiary, then it's going to immediately move over. So you're still going to wind up making that, putting the positive charge on the more substituted carbon. Um, and this is just reminding you why that that is the case. Um, when you put when you have an empty p orbital next to a carbon that has a hydrogen, the carbon that has a hydrogen can donate some electron density to that empty p orbital, which makes it a little bit less empty, a little bit more stable. Versus if you had a methyl cation, you don't have any any bonds nearby that can line up. It's almost like it's making like a partial pi bond. When you have these sigma bonds that are tetra on a tetrahedral carbon next to an empty p orbital, it's almost like you can make a partial pi bond. And so that makes it, the more of that we can have, the more, they call it hyperconjugation, you have the more stable that empty p orbital is. Um, so, and, and again, what's, what's important is that you know the trend, not that you could draw this picture, um, but it's, it's useful for understanding why we care, whether it's tertiary or secondary. All right, so let's, let's practice. What is the major product for each of the following alkenes when they react with HBr? I'll give you a few minutes to do that and then I'll, I'll draw the products.
So we do still need to pay attention to making sure we count to four, but not five when it comes to carbon bonds. But that's not so hard when it comes to these addition reactions because we're starting from an alkene. So you can't have an alkene that, that has four other things attached to it. So if we're break, as long as you remember that you're breaking the pi bonds, um, then you should be able to, to make sure that you didn't add five bonds to a carbon. So our first um, reaction here, break the pi bond. We're going to add hydrogen to the methyl side, which means the bromine goes to the more substituted carbon. Here we have two pi bonds, but they're identical. So pick one, doesn't matter which one you pick, you're gonna break a pi bond, add a hydrogen to one side and bromine to the other. Same here, it doesn't matter that the alkene is part of the ring, as long as it's not a benzene ring, as long as it's not a full aromatic ring, uh, it doesn't matter that the pi bond is part of the ring structure, still so follows our same rules. Put your bromine, put your nucleophile on the more substituted carbon. And don't forget to erase the pi bond. What would be different if it was if it was hydrochloric acid instead of hydrobromic acid? Superficially, it's a little bit different because you'd be drawing chlorines instead of bromines, right? But none of the rules changed because of that. And so if you just went down the line and you replaced every bromine with a chlorine, then you would get the product of the hydrochlorination as opposed to the hydrobromination. And then I know I'm out of time, but just to make the point here and to leave us in a good spot for Tuesday, the the next extension of this I already mentioned, and it's okay, well, if you have an alkene plus water instead of plus, um, plus an acid, you still need an acid catalyst to start things, to go through that first rate determining step. Do you need to break the alkene to make the carbocation? And water is not a good enough acid to do that on its own. But if you have a little bit of an acid there, usually sulfuric acid, um, and you would wind up with what's called a hydration reaction where you break a pi bond and you add a hydrogen to one side of the pi bond and an OH to the other. So the net result is you added a water molecule. You just add the water molecule in two places. And that's why we call it hydration as opposed to hydrogenation, which is a different reaction that we'll go over. It's a different addition reaction. Hydrogenation adds a hydrogen to both sides. Hydration adds a water molecule. So just think hydration means water, right? It means drink a lot of water. That's how we'll keep it straight. And we will start with this on Tuesday, right? Good first lecture to everyone. If you wanted to go over any questions, if you had any questions about how the class is gonna be structured that you didn't wanna ask, um, here, then I do have office hours at 1030. Um, it's a, a different Zoom link. So make sure you go to my office hours Zoom link, um, but I'll be there from 1030 to 1130. So stop on by if you have anything you want to talk about. Thanks, Sean. No problem. Thank have you. a good one, guys. Have a good weekend.